Welcome, everybody. Good evening, afternoon, uh, wherever you're tuning in from, whether this is the replay or you're watching live. We are so grateful you are here today because, as usual, we have great, great guests, uh, people that just inspire me, that I love, and that's why they're here. Because, you know, we as Physician Co Support as a platform bring every single month a new physician that tells us tools, ideas, you know, ways to really help us in our daily life, in our practice, in our mindset and movement, whatever it is. But this month is so special because we know, uh, you know, burnout is real. We know so many physicians are just leaving medicine and there is a better way and a different way and a really helpful way to practice medicine. And that's what we want to talk about. And this is from just you know, Dr. Diana Granita, she is my twin in the name, but she really is such an expert and a wealth of knowledge. And we were talking about this before we went live of all the resources she has created, of all the experience she has. And we're really going to dive into what this is all about for people that don't know what direct specialty care is and how we can help our colleagues, help our patients, and really help the community in the world really get to a place of healing and bring back that doctor-patient relationship where we have time, where we you know, are not rushed, where we're not burdened by all these external factors that are not helping us, like insurance plans and EMRs that are not helpful. So there is a better way. And that's what we really want to talk about today. And we really want to just dive in because there's so much that I want to make sure you get out of this today. If you're listening uh, or you want to put any uh, questions in the chat or you know replays, just let us know. And we'll make sure that all the resources are here. So thank you so much for being here. I am just so delighted. We are connecting and we get to spend one hour with you and just really talk about your journey and you know everything that you're going to share with us. So please, please, um, you know, Thank you for being here or like, not thank you really. And tell us a little bit about you. You know, I know you are local to me. You're in Los Angeles area, but tell us about you and how this all started for you and what really this is all about. Diana, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm following you for years now. And um, I appreciate the fact that you are trying to help other physicians. And the fact that there is a physician who unites other physicians, that's very inspiring for me because that's the purpose of my um, my alliance, the Direct Specialty Care Alliance. So to begin with my story, I was a physician like all of you in the traditional employed system. I've done all the jobs that you can imagine from being in academia to private practice to an employed position. So I've done it all before I jump out of the ship. In 2018, I started to realize that um, my place in the traditional system was very, very, I would say, I, I started to itch a little bit because I was seeing the situation of the patients. Um, I was seeing a lot of patients struggling to see me once the insurance company will change and every year they will change the insurance company, they will have difficulties to see me. So trying to see how can I help my patients, I realized that patients that continue to see me, they were financially burdened because of the cost that came with the was, was associated um, care that I was providing. But when I try to help my patients and I try to go to the you know administration, my my manager there, you know, I got a very simple answer that my role there is to see the patient, not to solve the business part. And in a way, I started to realize, you know, we as physicians, we don't know anything about the business part. And I felt frustrated because we know so many things. We are experts into uh, Y, <laughs> into X, Y, and Z, but we don't know anything about business. Is that so hard? So I was trying to find some solutions and I realized that uh, the, the system is also burdening me, burdening me because I had three kids and no life. I had the money, but no life. I was getting home from uh, my work around five or six in the afternoon. I was paying everybody to take care of my kids uh, from cooking, cleaning, taking kids to activities, which was not, you know, I, I didn't feel right for uh, for this situation. And then I realized that um, after I was done with dinner and putting the kids to sleep, I was going back to charts, as you probably all do. And I was staying in charts until sometimes 12 or one in the morning, because I was not able to type well. 
Um, and I, many times I was discussing with patients, but I was not um, writing notes or I was putting my orders, giving the instructions, but I was not typing the notes. So that became a burnout, a burnout in the end. And I was thinking, how can I help my patients? How can I um, save myself? And I was thinking, you know what, there is something that we can do, telemedicine, you know, we can scrutinize the patients that don't need to be in the office and we can maximize the, the flow and we can use telemedicine as a new tool. But guess what, when I went with this idea to um, my employer, they said that they cannot bill for telemedicine. So it was- Pre-COVID, I guess. Yes, pretty pre-COVID, correct. Mm -hmm. And then, then I said to myself, you know, this is unfair. You know, patients are traveling for three to four hours to see me. They struggle to see me when the insurance changes. Um, I don't have any control on, on the finances that, or on the test that I will order for them. I had no idea how much a test will cost until a patient will come and complain to me because I was the interface between the, the, the patient and the system. They didn't care that the charge was done by the hospital. I was the one who ordered the test. I was the one responsible. And trying to solve these issues, I sat down and I said, you know what? There has to be another way of doing medicine. And um, I thought about my country where there are two systems, parallel systems, the private system and the social system. In the social system, you don't get almost anything done without bribing someone or finding the connections. You have a mess with two? I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> and in the private system, you have everything up front, okay? You know that you're going to see a physician. You have the access, but you have to pay. And it's a fair price, I would say. Um, Nobody is overcharging you 10 times more the price of a test, like here. Or nobody is not disclosing to you. I mean, they will disclose to you, this is how much the physician will charge. These are the cost of the test. So patients will know that, Yes, if they pay, they will get the things done. So at that point, I realized that I knew a physician, a friend of mine who did direct primary care. Mm -hmm. And I went to her and I asked her, what are you doing here? It's like, can you do that in the United States? And she said, yes, you can do contract between you and a lab. You can do contract between you and an imaging center. You can do, you can even find some resources for medication and you just have to be transparent for your price. And then she told me about the memberships that they are doing. And, but she also said that she will see patients for fee for service, but her prices were very, very transparent on her website and on her clinic door, the prices were there. So I started to think myself, why are we specialists not doing that? And I had no idea of anyone in the country doing that when I started to research this. And little by little, as a very good friend and mentor of mine will say, I started to discover ways to do that. And I jumped off the ship completely. <laughs> in 2019, I started my company uh, which was a telemedicine-based company, uh, rheumatologist on call, to provide telemedicine services at that point in three states. And then I gradually got to see patients in 10 states. But it was a process and it was a challenging time because at the same time, COVID came. And yes, it helped me with the telemedicine part, but it didn't help me with the patients accessing us because patients, as you know, um, they were in a in a process to understand what is telemedicine. Uh, left, you know, no think about why should I pay directly to a physician. So it was quite a challenge to educate patients to understand why would I do or what why would I provide direct care services for rheumatology. Yeah, that's amazing. I mean, there's so many pearls there that, you know, are so important. Like we start, like the thing is like that I see from what you're telling me is like we start to question. And I think sometimes as physicians, we don't question. We don't ask the why or why not. You know, and the part of the is honestly, because we have been trained not to speak up and raise our hand and like, you know, go against the current one or we're going to just get smacked or like, you know, uh, really 
uh, not talked very kindly to. And also because we really are honestly on like survival state where we're like just trying to survive. And when you're survival, you're not in like a curious, like, let me think about this state. You're just trying to survive and trying to hopefully have some lunch and eat and maybe try to sleep like three hours. So it's challenging to question. It's challenging to ask why or like, why not? Or why could it be different? But you really did start to do that. And that is so important for anybody. It's really like how children think about life all day, asking the whys. And it is important to do so now saying the status quo when we know it's broken, because then you realize patients are not getting care. You're getting burned out. You don't get to see your kids. You're using all your money to pay other people to take care of them. And something's just not right. And I think, you know, although you didn't say it aloud, it's like, it's sort of like your intuition saying like, this doesn't feel right. Um, it's not so much your logical brain, but it's like part of like a feeling that something's off. And I also think as physicians, we ignore that part, <laughs> that feeling that something your body's saying something's off and we just push through it. And then again, we get to burnout. So I love that you honor that. I love that you started to, figure out ways. And then the other critical part is like, you ask for help. You ask a friend that has already walked this walk and you ask for like, well, what can I do? And of course, then you have to do all the work. It's not just going to happen and fall in your lap. You're going to do the work to figure this out. But, you know, that's the other thing. It's like, we're smart people. Like we can figure this stuff out. Like if we did all of this training, we can figure things we've never done before. Um, and and I, I love that because, you know, I kind of walked your path a little bit because I've done, you know, the whole gamut of all, like, you know, uh, been my own practice, employed this, academic, you know, all of it. And I think, you know, we can do a lot of stuff and just gain information from every experience because we learn from everything we do, right or wrong. And then we just get to choose what we want to do, how we want to do it, what works for us. Now, if staying employed or whatever you're in works, then that's great. I'm not saying to jump the ship, but if you're feeling something is off <laughs> in your body or you're feeling the burnout or the stress or the dread of getting out of the car or the overwhelm or the cynicism, I mean, these are signs of burnout. And then we got to figure out what else next. So I love that. You ask for help, you started to investigate, you do your research, you start to figure out, and then you have the courage to jump, you know, and probably get a little wet, but really grow through that. And, you know, then you started, you know, your own practice, which again, very, very rare. First of all, to be a rheumatologist, there's not many in the country. So you're like a unicorn to begin with. Then to do this direct specialty care, you know, and it's not primary, it's different. And for those that still don't kind of know what it is, I mean, can you kind of explain more what what direct special care means? Like, are you never seeing any insurance? Absolutely. Um, you know, like there's many flavors and I know we can ha have a whole seminar on all this stuff, like, you know, membership, uh, just fee for service of what they're going to pay you directly. There's many permutations, but can you explain Absolutely. a little bit? Because some people don't even know truly what it is, which, you know, I was definitely in the boat that I don't even know what this means. So maybe explain that to people that are listening. Um, and then we can dive in a little bit of like some options. Again, this could be a whole five week course. And I know we'll talk about that too, because you created something to help others. We'll get there as well. But start with just the basics for, for those um, that are not sure yet. So direct specialty care, this term of direct specialty care did not exist about three years ago. Mm. This term uh, came out after I was thinking, how can we position ourselves versus our colleagues in direct primary care? So to make it simple, not to copy them, but to make it simple to send out the message, I was having a conversation with a colleague of mine, um, which I met through Facebook. You're going to laugh about that, but I did meet a, a great group of people, great group of physicians. If COVID brought us something good, brought us together. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the, the COVID era brought the physicians together. And um, I know you know, a lot of physicians that they got help through that connection through Facebook. So this colleague of mine, uh, her name is Lara, Lara, um, Dr. Lara Kenny. I connected with her through Facebook and we started to talk about because she was a hematologist. She was doing primary care, direct primary care, and she was offering here and there some services for hematology, oncology. She has multiple certifications. But she was also going through a period of her life when she has to she had to quit everything and she started direct primary care. So with 
within that discussion, um, I said to her, Lara, why don't we form this or start this movement of direct specialty or direct specialists? I call it initially specialists for direct care. But then I said to myself, you know, let's make it simple because people already recognize direct primary care, let's say direct specialty care, because it's going to help specialists conceptualize the direct care movement. Yes. Because before this term existed, um, and before, and even today, I have to tell you, even today, specialists have this idea that they have to have somebody to refer patients to them. Mm. Patients will not come directly to them. They think about, okay, direct primary care is simple because patients come to the primary care, but who's going to come to me as a specialist in direct care? Mm -hmm. So we started to use this term. I use it everywhere. I published, I don't know how many articles I published about this term. I was even featured in the New York Times talking about direct care or direct specialty care. And I started to use this term a lot. And then a lot of specialists find out about us and they started to ask, what is it? Mm -hmm. So let me kind of put it in a very, very short or form. We don't contract with insurance. So direct specialists or direct care specialists do not contract with insurance. But that doesn't mean that the patient cannot use their insurance to uh, pay for labs, for imaging, for their medication. But the patient has to understand that they have a direct contract with the physician and the physician is not reimbursed by the insurance company. The physicians do not have contracts with insurance companies but they can use the patient insurance to help you maximize your benefits, mm -hmm. okay? I don't know if that's clear because yeah. I have a lot of questions um, from, from specialists about that. The idea is that you as a physician, you have to be paid to a fair price, transparent price by whoever is using your services. And if lawyers are doing that, if accountants are doing that, then why not physicians cannot do that? And again, in a very accessible, transparent way, fair to the patients, because we don't charge crazy amount of money for our consultations, but we want to be compensated fairly. Yeah, no, I mean, it's pretty simple. I mean, we just, you don't take insurance, but the patients can keep their insurance. Nobody's saying don't have Absolutely. insurance. Absolutely. But they will use that when you order a lab, when you order the imaging, they use the insurance benefits for that. But everything that happens between the direct specialty physician and the patient, it is a direct payment to you, uh, which is really important for those people that are not physicians and don't know, you know, if you use insurance, it may take six months, 12 months, sometimes to get paid after fighting because things get denied, which is ridiculous. I mean, when you go to McDonald's, they don't get paid, you know, 12 months later for the hamburger you, you ate. So the fact that this is okay in physician world, it's insanity. So again, removing that barrier and giving those fair prices that are upfront and transparent. I mean, there's nothing that complicated about it. And it's just also allowing you that time that is not every 50 minutes, 50 patients a day to try to get people in to really spend time with the patients and get to know them and get to really listen to them and understand what's going on with them and how to better take care of them. Because I mean, let's go one-on-one -on -one. is like, you got to know the history and talk to people and listen. And so much of, I think of what I do all day, personally, at least is like listening to people and just even, you know, it's just healing to have somebody listen to you, whether it's a friend or definitely a physician. If we don't have the time to listen, I'm not sure we're healing very well. So removing that barrier of that constraint of people telling you how much time you should have in a very short and absolutely insane time frame to take care of people, um, you know, is really, I think, another huge benefit apart from being able to get paid fairly on time and the day of the service. And, uh, you know, it's just, again, bringing back that one-on-one, -on -one, removing all the noise and, and making that accessible, good physician, you know, available for the patients. So I think you did explain it, you know, very easily uh, what it is. And, you know, you kind of mentioned a little bit, you started this term, you know, you really started bringing uh, other people in, but then you, you, you really formed something that is really valuable that I hope people can join and just 
even research a little more, which is the Direct Specialty Care Alliance. So can you tell people what that is and yes. you know, how, like, what is this doing? How can you, uh, you know, get into it? So if you are thinking or you know a colleague that could benefit that is thinking maybe they're not in the right spot or employment, uh, you know, agreement, like where can they find about this and what is it? Absolutely. Direct Specialty Care Alliance was started with this goal to help other physicians, educate them about their options. In the COVID era, I had uh, friends who left medicine forever because they didn't know their options are open. So in order to help other physicians create this sense of a community of people that are doing direct care, and for patients to find us, for other physicians to find us, if, we, if there is a physician in direct care, they will know where their colleagues are. If there is a physician that they want to become a direct care specialist, they know where to find some resources to, or to read about the concept or to learn about the concept because we evolve from only telling people about what it is to helping people understand the concept. And we even give them a frame of work. We organized um, a lot of webinars and I'm gonna tell you about all these resources. So. We have written articles um, that are published from Kevin MD to Medscape to um, New York Times. So again, very respectable sources um, that we try to find. Um, then I have created an online course that is given with a discount to the members of our uh, community. And um, even if you are not a member, you can still take that course and dive into to this concept, kind of find a frame of work and understand where you can start. Uh, because a lot of people will ask questions um, about, can I do this if I'm employed? Can I do this if I'm in Medicare? Uh, can I do this if, um, for example, uh, I want to do this as a part-time uh, job? Um, so there are so many questions, but we, or is this for my specialty? Does this apply to my specialty? Because I'm a surgeon. I don't think I'm a rheumatologist like you. I cannot see patients online. You know, a lot of things that we try to clarify through this course. But on top of that, we I have started a YouTube channel. It's called Direct Specialty Care Alliance. Um, there is a website, dscalliance.org, uh, where people will find information. And I'm happy to provide you all of this uh, to, to share it with, um, with the people interested. And in that channel, the YouTube channel, I invited people that adopted the direct care model. Some of them were helped by us. And they share their stories, they share their tips, they share their success. What I can tell you is that we helped and we opened the eyes to so many people. And so many people are very appreciative that they find a way to continue to practice medicine because we offer these kind of resources along the last three years now. Mm -hmm. And what we will continue to do, we will continue to provide webinars for our members because uh, we find a lot of value into that. We we that we practice direct care, we meet with these people that are in the beginning or in the research phase, and we ask we we answer their questions. Mm -hmm. So where do you get that? You know, where do you get colleagues that will answer your questions honestly from their experience? and telling you, you should do this, you should not do that, because that costs me a lot of money and it's not worth it. I'll give you a simple example. You know, people think that if they pay a company to start their business, they're gonna be successful. Or they think if they pay a marketing company that has, I don't know how many um, success stories on their website, they will be successful and patients will come to them. Guess what? We tell them that's not the case. We tell them how to do it. And we tell them from our experience, from things that worked, and we tell them how to accelerate this, I would say this roadmap in order to be successful. Not only that I want to keep this information for me, I'm sharing it with you. Take it and do whatever you want with this information. But this is very valuable because instead of doing the same mistakes that we all did, yeah, it's when really we started, it, it's it's going to ease your way into the direct care. Um, and that's why this YouTube channel will show you the people that, again, got help, 
got the success story and not a single one will complain about their decision, yeah. which is great. That's so, I mean, the, I'm so inspired. Like, I mean, talk about positive impact and just helping so many people. Like, good Lord. I mean, you really, uh, yeah, you're just like a beacon of light with so many people because I, I know people, friends, colleagues, and, and by the way, about 125 to 150,000 physicians have black medicine. That's a lot, you know, and, and just permanently. And, 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 and we already in a shortage. And so we don't need people leaving. They're well-trained and like good people. You know, we need them. We're all patients. And so we want to hopefully bring some back, keep the ones that are here, you know, with like, you know, options. You don't have to be in this awful place where you're burned out and miserable. So hopefully it can be an option if somebody's looking for options of ways you can do it with that roadmap, with a community, with people that have done it and people that are not sleazy wheezy or again, selling their $10,000 course for marketing. And then it flops. I have friends that have done these, oh, I'm going to market your practice for direct care. And it just has gone nowhere. <laughs> it's like cricket. Absolutely. And, and then they're asking me like, well, should I do this other coaching thing? Should I do this? And I'm like, I mean, who are these people that you're trying to, you know, buy courses from? Like, what is their record? Who has done their course? I mean, this is what I asked when they were telling me about this. And I said, have you talked to the people that have gone through it? You know, what is their record? And they really couldn't. And I said, well, if that was my $5,000, I would not use them there. But again, everybody has to, you know, learn those lessons. But if these are, again, a group that has done it, that are physicians, helping physicians. I mean, there's just no better group, I think, in my opinion, of yeah. somewhere you should go and, and really get that help. Because I think at the core, physicians are good people that want to help others. And when we help each other, that's even just like so much better, you know, the chair on top. So you will definitely put that resource, obviously, for this alliance, for people to you know, find other physicians, you know, maybe the YouTube channel, maybe get the membership to learn more. Um, and I know that you talked about YouTube, but you also, <laughs> also have this other huge YouTube channel, which is for your own specialty, um, really educating mostly patients. But I mean, it's been like viewed 10 million times. I mean, it has some ridiculous amount of subscribers and <laughs> views, and you're very humble about this big old thing you have going there. So I'm curious, you know, was this something you started before the uh, direct specialty care? Was it during, you know, obviously it's going to augment traffic to come to your practice because people see you on YouTube and they learn from you. And, um, you know, so for, for people also, again, it's a tool adjunct they can use for even your current practice, even if you stay employed, you know, using YouTube as a tool uh, to give back, to educate patients. And, you know, I have my own too, and, you know, it's not that big, but I do it out of love for my patients that are Latin because I do it in Spanish and English um, to really educate and get all this snake old nonsense about things that we do in urology and try to educate them of like what happens with procedure and things like that. So, you know, I do it because I love it and I want to help Spanish speaking patients, because I do speak that language, uh, but I know you do it uh, for so many people. So please share more about this, because uh, I think it can help others that, you know, maybe still don't want to do the specialty care, but may want to start a YouTube channel for many reasons. So how did this come about? I will tell you that um, I was an educator all my life. I was in academia. I had a lot of uh, medical students, residents. I actually put a lot of residents into fellowships, rheumatology fellowship. After they were meeting me, they were falling in love with rheumatology because I was very passionate about teaching them rheumatology because it's a specialty that many people stay away from because mm -hmm. they don't understand it. But once you got into the, you know, meat of rheumatology, you start to fall in love with it. And that's, you know, maybe not everybody is uh, in, fall, in love with rheumatology. But because of that, that need of me educating, and because I was seeing patients in need to get educated, and because I was seeing on social media, a lot of gurus mm -hmm. in autoimmune diseases, I said to myself, this is nonsense. We, that we know what we are talking about, that we do education every single day. We don't do it, but this guru are fully fooling people and they charge horrible amounts of money. I mean, mm -hmm. I cannot tell you how many patients they came to me and they said to me oh, that yeah, they pay like for, mm -hmm. they paid for whatever doctor which was not a doctor 
not a physician. They paid, they paid like, I don't know how much money for programs, for supplements, for you name it, you know, mm -hmm. the snake oil, like you said. And I was so bothered by that because I, and I said to myself, you know, I'm going to start with a, a lecture about supplements. Let me give you the, the, the scientific evidence for supplements because yeah, yeah. I knew certain things and I had to research others but I was diving into this and I put a powerpoint you're gonna laugh about it but it was a powerpoint where I was talking about supplements and here are the good ones here are the bad ones and that one exploded and I, I had a few other small movies but that one exploded and then I said to myself you know th there is so much need mm -hmm. to educate people and there were not many physicians on, on YouTube at that point when I started in 2022, I think wow. I started, something like that. Yeah, yeah. And there was Dr. Mike and a few other dermatologists which were um, very good about presenting aesthetics and things like that. But for rheumatology, I think it was another colleague of mine um, in Texas, uh, which I respect a lot because she does a wonderful job. And then I started and then I started to talk about what are autoimmune diseases and things that I was passionate about. And I was trying to educate people about how to recognize uh, certain diseases and how what can you do for that. It was all educational. I didn't promote my practice for a long time. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that that education was not only good for the general public, was also good for my patients. Mm -hmm. So whenever I, I had a patient with a new diagnosis, I was giving them that link yes and they loved it i it's was easy. like oh my god that's a great resource because you know i don't know if you are aware but half of the information that we talk to the patient goes away yep. and then a quarter of that information is getting they get it wrong correct so going back home and starting to kind of absorb that information it's useful for our patients and in our era uh the visual part is more important than what you what you have written. It didn't matter for me that I had, I don't know how many articles published in, in whatever. It didn't matter. Patients did not care about that. Yeah. Patients loved the fact that they could see my face mm -hmm. and I would explain to them again what the disease is and what are the options and things like that. And I started to fall in love with this because I thought, you know what? It's not only gonna give me the credibility that I am looking for at a wider uh, scale, mm -hmm. but it's it's good to educate patients. They do appreciate that that work because it's a lot of work. A lot of work, but it's, it's beautiful because I think yeah. you're so right. I mean, it's just for obviously grander audience of the world that can have Correct. access to somebody that is you know educated, academic, and knows the the, the information. But also your own patients. Um, and I do have a, a good colleague because the urologist David Kanth, who has his own company, kind of doing this of educating patients uh, with urological things pre and post appointments to get them ready uh, Correct. with with the information. So you're better as a patient, you know, uh, educated what to expect, what to ask. And it makes the appointment like, not that it's easier, but just more efficient in a way. And just more enjoyable that you're at the same level of like, okay, I understand the information. So either whether it's before the appointment that they already watch your channel and watch your, your talk, and they have some level of understanding what to ask, but also after, because like you said, people like listen probably to 20% of what is actually said during an appointment, especially they're afraid, they're nervous, you know, they're uncomfortable, whatever. So they, they don't like understand and don't listen because we're afraid as a patient. And it gives it time at their own convenience to consume the information again, watch it a hundred times if they need to, and just go over it at their own leisure, you know, no matter your age. And I think that is critical as you said, for potential patients, of course, but like as your own patients. And I do that with all my patients. After I, you know, schedule them for a biopsy, I send them the link for the biopsy uh, video and the cystoscopy and all the procedures I do, are like how to prevent kidney stones. You know, I send them those links, like how to put estrogen in your vulva. Like I send them that stuff so they can watch it. I mean, I'll explain it. I really will. But then I also send it because that way they have time to do it on their own time and they just feel more comfortable. They're like, they know what to expect. So when they come for their appointment, they're like, oh yeah, well, that's what you told me was going to happen. I'm like, well, that's what happened. <laughs> you know, they, they are aware and it just makes things just much easier. And when you know what to expect, things are just sometimes like less stressful. So I really love 
you know, how you had a passion. Well, first of all, you saw a problem and then you came up with a solution instead of just complaining about the problem, you do something, you do something positive. I, I love that, you know, when you do it out of love, things just explode and grow because that's the way to do things is with love and passion. And then, yeah, you change it and then you start, it sounds like, you know, kind of promoting it a little bit more for your practice and, you know, saying like subscribe because I love your, you know, like that's how a good YouTuber is like subscribe to my channel, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> you need that to grow it and it's not grows or cheeses like you have to do that that's what it's done you have to promote yourself and again share with your patients share with people that may benefit and uh, it's just wonderful I mean I just love how you evolve how you grew and just really again the positive impact so many millions of views uh, of people you're helping with this it's just like uh, I don't know your heart's so big and your impact uh, but I want to say something Diana yeah. YouTube wants physicians to be on the platform so oh, yeah. I have to tell you that yes. about a year ago, um, there is a group of physicians that we were on YouTube and we were contacted by YouTube. Mm -hmm. We were very skeptical at that point because you don't know, you know, yeah. so what do they want? Yeah. But they do want physicians to be on their platform to promote the good type of education and uh, reliable, credible information to the patients. And that's why you're going to see there um, um, on the videos that are by a physician, a licensed physician, because they verify you. Yes. Um, this comes from a healthcare provider or a licensed provider, healthcare provider. We don't like that, the provider, but, but they they say um, the video comes from a healthcare a source and they will prioritize your videos against others that are not physicians, then they just pretend that they know it all. And there are plenty of those on, on YouTube. Yeah. I and because of that, um, I will... I had so many physicians reaching out to me to teach them how to do YouTube. I'm going to start, a, a, it's it's more like a coaching group for 10 physicians only in October 1st, I'm going to start. And if people are interested to join, it's going to be three months uh, every two weeks, not not much because I don't have the time, but I'm very happy to to teach them the little things that I did not know. And I learn by paying others, you know, that yeah. are doing YouTube, not medical doctors, but yeah. those tricks that we don't know, we don't have any yep. idea that yep. they are important, mm -hmm. but that will speed up the grow on YouTube. Oh, I love that. That's so helpful. And yeah, I mean, I actually did a YouTube incubator with the YouTube people. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Positions. And yeah, they were like trying to help us, uh, but they didn't give us all these tips, you know, and I think this is so important, again, from people that have done it, that already Correct. have like you have the track record like to grow and you really are, you know, did it organically and grew it and you yes to pay people, but then now you know how to do it and you're teaching us again. I mean, I think that's like, you just learn and you get- I back. didn't pay a dime. I didn't pay a dime to no, anyone saying, to 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 advertise my video. I just let it organically, all no, organic. Saying, like you were trying to pay other people to help you, like you know, with things how to do things. But like, yeah, you know, now you're doing it to like you help other people and physicians. I think that's fantastic. But yeah, you grew organically and it just blew up because again, started with love, passion, and you know, wisdom, and just done really beautifully. And I've watched your videos, and I'm like, oh, she knows exactly what she's doing. You know, like this is how you stand. This is where you put the info. This is a beautiful beautiful graphics. I mean, like the timing, it's all really beautiful. So if you want just a masterclass, just watch one of the videos. We'll put the links on the YouTube channel so you can watch and just see, okay, if you're interested, maybe you don't take the thing the, the course in October, maybe you really should, but um, you can just even by watch, watching these videos, get some tips of like how it's done correctly. Um, and I know there's a very big group of even urologists are very big on YouTube um, that are, are really killing it and then doing a great job of teaching patients, colleagues, physicians, everybody, you know, so much about our specialty because sometimes we don't know and we're like, oh, is this normal? Or like, what is this rash? Or like, what should I do? So you look up people that have a good track record and then you, as you know, as a colleague can learn from people that have all of the things. And we have a question that says, sure. indirect care model, how do you handle the patient that sees you uh, that unexpectedly needs like this non-emergent, non-911, but necessary hospitalization as a specialist. Who will follow this patient for this non-emergent hospitalization? I would definitely tell my patients that I'm not 24-7 and I'm not their primary care and I'm not their, um, you know, physician. But if they need a, a 
you know, a hospitalization, I will direct them either, to, I will direct them to the hospital to be admitted there. I do follow up on what's going on um, at that point. I do ask the records, but I cannot be involved in that care because I'm not part of the hospital system. Um, but again, I think your question needs to be a little bit more specific for your specialty. Uh, my specialty is different. I do have patients that will need hospitalization like lupus patient, but Again, not all the specialties will have. I don't know what exactly she means by non-emergent, because there I don't understand that part. Yeah, hopefully she will clarify them. You can see, but yeah, I mean, I guess the other question is like, if you are direct specialty care, like, do you are you always available twenty four seven? Are they, you know, if this is a concierge practice, they call you at two a.m., five a.m. when you're on. No, a are they still calling you? I think some physicians feel like, well, this is just going to be a different. Uh, type of handcuffs, because I'm always going to be available. I'm never going to have a break. So how do you handle that? Maybe that's a good question too, of maybe like boundaries or is this in your contract yes. that you have with patients? So, uh, you know, are you always available? Does somebody cover you? You know, uh, how, how much hours are you there for patients or just kind of business hours? How do, how do you do it? And I know there's many ways to do this, but how do you handle it in your practice? I think that you can decide what you want to do for your practice. What I do tell my patients is that between nine and five, I am available for them. That's my time frame when I'm at work and I check messages, I will reply to them. I will do the pre-authorization. I will do the medical medication refills, all of that. Um, I can see them or I can call them and they know that's the time frame that I work. Um, from time to time, I have patients that will message me in the evening. If I have time, I will reply. I used to reply to everybody because I wanted everybody to be happy, but it's no longer that. And patients do understand that you have a life, you have a family. I share that with them in the contract that they sign. It's very clear written that I'm not available 24-7. And I'm available between these hours and these hours. And for emergency, they have to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's spelled out clearly there. If I'm going in vacation, I let my patients know. If there is an emergency, I, I'm still carrying my phone with me and I'll get the messages. But if there is an emergency, I have my nurse who is going to be there. I always make sure that somebody is in the office you know, to take care of, at least answer the messages and somebody will call me if there is need for me to intervene. But it doesn't happen. You know, people, have, they have this misconception that direct care is concierge care. No, we can, you know, we can say that we are some sort of concierge because we are accessible, very accessible compared to the traditional system. But we don't charge the extra premiums like concierge doctors. Um, but we do offer access and transparent pricing for what we do. Yeah, and this is, um, if a patient self-referred, they may not realize that they may have a hospitalization need that may not be obvious to the patient when making the request for the appointment. So, That's okay. You can evaluate the patient and say to the patient, you know, at this point, I cannot take care of you. It's not safe. You have to go to the hospital. Um, I mean, people with experience, and I know probably all of you who have experience here, um, you know when a patient needs to be in the hospital versus outpatient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love what you sort of touched upon, which we didn't talk about earlier, because yeah, there's a difference between just direct specialty or primary and concierge. And you could definitely be both. I mean, you could be a concierge direct specialty, uh, or can you just be one? I mean, people sometimes uh, don't know the difference of one. So can you explain a little bit more about like concierge uh, you know, anytime that you are direct specialty, are you concierge or not? Do you dif differentiate? How does that sort of work? Uh, and again, do you also market your practice as concierge or you just kind of take that no. language away? I took that language away. Um, I know some direct care specialists will keep concierge because of convenience reasons, because people are more used to this idea of uh, going to a concierge practice, I have to pay. Mm -hmm. But the idea, um, the difference, the big difference between, between direct care and uh, concierge practices is that direct care specialists or physicians do not contract with insurance companies to be paid for their services. 
uh, concierge practices or concierge, the, the classic concierge um, practices, they, the physicians are contracted with the insurance companies, will be reimbursed uh, for their services by insurance companies. But on top of that, they will ask a fee. It's an annual retention most of the time. Um, that is between 2,000 and 30,000 per year. So it varies with the, with the uh, how famous that doctor is. And they will charge that as an extra fee to provide patients with access when they need it the most, usually, you know, when an emergency happens. And they also guarantee a little bit more time with the patients, but that doesn't always happen in concierge practices. I mean, you can still have 15 to 20 minutes with for a new visit uh, with your concierge doctor. We try to give a little bit more time to our patients, but what we don't charge, we don't have anything to deal with for our services with insurance companies. Yeah, that's, that's a really good clarification. And again, uh, the, the, I love the two that you definitely spell it on your contract with patients of the time and then the hours. And again, the concierge definitely still take insurance, but they will add that premium uh, price, you know, per year or membership, however they do it, uh, to already charging the, the insurance plan. So that there is a difference, although some direct specialty primary can add that label concierge to kind of make it okay, well, like that's why you feel comfortable paying because it's concierge and I'm accessible. But again, it may not meet, mean 24 seven access. And again, you have to know that and spell that out for your practice, how you want to do it. And again, this will be something that definitely many people have asked, or you can uh, find out more in this alliance and this membership to understand, like these are common questions. These are common things people are asking or doing or don't realize the difference. And that may be something that is a fear that is holding people back from doing it, realizing that like, that's not even how it is. You know, we have this fear and we made up a story in our head and it's not even true. And it's holding us back from jumping ship and, and doing something different. Um, and I also want to talk, you know, before we leave here tonight, I mean, apart from all these things that you've done, this alliance, your YouTube, your articles, being in New York Times, here, there, everywhere, you also just published your book, which I love because you know, I think any physician that doesn't address nutrition, I mean, we're sort of like failing. Nutrition is essential for every specialist, whether you're a cardiologist, dermatologist, urologist, rheumatologist. I mean, nutrition is something I never learned at UCLA med school, but it is so important to address for prevention, for treatment, and for healing if you don't have the right food, uh, because food is your illness, your disease, or your health. And so you wrote this wonderful book that is just coming out and it's going to be shipped soon. It's called the um, Complete Gout Management Nutrition Guide, How to Impair, Empower Strategies for Better Health. So there it is. Um, so mine's coming soon in the mail. Uh, but but tell us how this came about. What is this for? And obviously we'll put the links for people that want to learn more about this book for themselves or for patients. Yeah, I think people uh, probably think that I paid you <laughs> to No, you me. did it. I just love you. And I think this is so important. Like you have to no. like- you know, but really I want to like give credit to people who are doing amazing things. No, um, no, no. I wanted like, to say thank so you. Good. This is the book. Um, I want to say thank you for pointing out towards all of this. Um, I think this book would never happen if I didn't have the time that I have today in mm -hmm. direct specialty care. So I, if I want people to take something out of this is that we are capable for doing so much more that we don't even understand. And this is my story about, I was not, um, you know, I was not able to understand how much I can do by stepping outside of the traditional system. And that's what I want your um, audience to take from, from this. It's not an advertising to me, but I, I appreciate your help and your pointing out towards all of this. Um, and like you said, it's so important for us as physicians to understand both worlds, the holistic part of medicine, because patients are eager to learn from a physician that they can try different, um, different what they call diets, but it's not diets, it's lifestyle. It's a different type of, um, or a, actually a lifestyle. They have to change their lifestyle, which includes the nutrition, the sleep, the mindfulness, mm -hmm. um, um, and exercise. I learned 
like you from my patients and I share in this book stories from my patients with gout and how we change certain things in their diet and how they got better. Um, and this is very important because I myself with a PhD in immunology, I always believe in science. Um, I did so much training in my life, but when I was in my 40s and patients were starting to educate me about what they do uh, regarding food, supplements, mindfulness, I was clueless. I did not know what they are talking about. And initially I have this reaction that I said, ah, oh, maybe this is not, this is not for me. You know, this, I, I'm, I'm a girl of science. I believe in science. And at some point, Another patient taught me a very important lesson. He said to me, you should look it up. Mm -hmm. And at that point I said, you know what? I'm not doing that. You know, I did that for immunology. Yeah. I look up a lot of things. I do that for the drugs that I'm prescribing. I do that for the, for the uh, diseases, but I'm not looking up supplements and I'm not looking up nutrition yeah. is really a value there. So that's how I started. I look it up and I found information that was published in respectable journals about certain um, changes um, like the Mediterranean diet. And then in the end, I went to take a course at Stanford for understanding the science behind nutrition. And that's how I became more knowledgeable in the field. I love that. I mean, it really is so, so important. And, you know, I deal with kidney stones a lot, which is kind of goes with you because, you know, if you have gout, then one of the things you can get is uric acid, kidney stones. And I do a lot of prevention. And, you know, when people follow like the kidney stone diet, let's call it, um, you know, but it really is just a healthy diet, kind of Mediterranean diet. It, you know, people, of course, stop having kidney stones, but also they reverse their diabetes. They like lose a ton of weight and they just feel better. And so, Yes, I want to help your kidney stones, but I'm actually help, helping your metabolic health and other aspects. And, you know, I had patients that were diagnosed diabetic when they saw me because they had kidney stones. And that's how they found they had hemoglobin of God knows what. And then they really committed and then they did it. And then they came back 100 pounds lighter, you know, uh, no more diabetes and like no kidney stones now, I think for three years uh, after doing the work. So it really does matter and it changes. And like what you eat, again, becomes your disease. And like a lot of what I do is like explaining to patients, you know, probably six sodas a day is not the right way to go. You know, it's like, it is kind of like the devil and sugar is the devil. And I go with my sugar uh, TED talk for a while, but you know, it really, like some patients don't know and they're 75 years old and they don't realize how much sugar is in a Coke. And there's like, you know, six grams of sugar and even healthy foods like yogurt is full of sugar, even though it's healthy and just understanding food types and basic things like this is protein and this is carbs and this is just sugar and there's no nutrition and pasta is just carbs and it's okay, but like you got to add the vegetables and you know, like just basic things that to me, you know, I was, I guess, blessed to grow up with, you know, in a family that nutrition was a big thing and it was talked about since I was very little. So I kind of knew it, but so many people don't uh, understand, and even as physicians, we don't get any uh, education on it. So we have to educate ourselves, no matter what specialty we're in, because it will matter. Again, how your skin looks depends on your nutrition and what's inflammatory, how you feel. If you're a psychiatrist, like the gut and the brain axis are real. So if your microbiome is destroyed, you're going to get depressed. I mean, it's all related. Absolutely. So we need to understand that no matter what specialty we're in, it matters if you're a cardiologist, you know, like the heart stuff is, you know, cholesterol, foods that doesn't help you, all this. So, you know, I think I, I love the book because, I mean, I can gain a lot of knowledge for myself personally and for patients and it's just a resource so I'm grateful you also wrote it and again understanding that when you have time and you're not in chronic fight or flight or survival mode there's so much creativity that can come out of that you're not going to be creative when you're in stress mode but when you step back when you have time to be with your kids when you have time to do things for you like this creative you know, energy that comes out of you and this positivity impact that you can have with the world, it's its just like ripples effect. And I think, yes, you did not pay me to be here, uh, but I just endorse you because I love you. And because I just Thank you. think it's so important to really highlight people who are doing amazing things that are very humble uh, with, but with all this amazing information. And hopefully it can be a beacon of light, a seat of hope 
that can say, wow, she did it because that's how I felt about you this whole time. I'm like, wow, she's like really doing all this stuff. Like, how does she do that? Even if I've never talked to you, I get inspired. So I think inspiration is so important in our lives, whether we get it from any source. So hopefully this uh, you know, podcast episode was inspiring to you or to others. We will put all the notes on the show notes where you can find uh, Dr. Granita for her practice, for the direct uh, specialty care alliance, for the YouTube channels, you know, everything in the book. So hopefully, again, you can share with somebody else that can be helped because that's the whole purpose of, I think, life, helping each other walk along this path. Um, I do love this quote from Ram Dass, like we're all walking each other home. And I think that is a purpose, like helping each other to get to a better place. After we have the scars and pains, we can help other people. So again, if you're a physician, you know somebody that can really benefit from coach support, which is, uh, you know, physiciancoachsupport.com. It's a free and confidential platform where we're all physicians, we're all life coaches, and we're there to help you with anything. If you feel like an imposter, you're tired, you're mad at your boss, you need to make a decision, you want to quit and you want to talk to somebody, we're there without judgment just to talk about it. And talking about it with somebody without judgment is huge. And we're there because we care, because most of us have been in burnout and there's a better way to live. And hopefully, you know, it can get you in a one step to taking care of yourself realizing you matter, you're worthy, and there's a better way. So again, thank you for everybody that was here tonight. Please share the replay when it comes out. And thank you, Diana, for just being here and your time, your wisdom, and just sharing all this that I really think is just saving so many lives in so many ways. Um, so I'm really, really grateful. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And um, thank you to everybody that took the time to be here tonight. It's, it's, it's very important for us to be together, to help each other, because as physicians, we have to kind of retrain our mind to understand that we are all in the same pot and we can we can survive. Yes, <laughs> we will. We're going to thrive. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Have Absolutely. a good night. Bye-bye.